What's going on guys, RBG here, back with another update on Marvel's Avengers. As you've noticed in the past few days, we've been getting a ton of new information regarding this game. A couple days ago, Crystal Dynamics released a brand new trailer showcasing snippets of things to come, and I was able to uncover some of the newer things we saw briefly such as the Hulk's alternate costume, which is a reference to his Planet Hulk comic book look, and there was also more gameplay showcasing Iron Man's precision lasers, which all looks amazing. And we can look forward to an even bigger rollout of information on June the 24th. While we wait patiently for that info, I want to talk about some of the things that were recently revealed but probably went under a lot of people's radar. Now before we get started on the video, I gotta give a huge shout out to today's sponsor too, buddy. As a successful YouTube user, I often get questions asking what I use to get my videos tons of views, and the answer to that is TubeBuddy. This thing has helped me take my channel to the next level in ways I never imagined. It's a browser extension that helps new and experienced YouTubers grow fast and optimize their channels. I've been using this extension for years and it's constantly getting updated with new features, like the SEO tool that helps me come up with the perfect title, description, and tags to get more people to click on my videos. It even provides you with analytics besides your videos to see how much traffic your video is generating from various social media sites. The extension is absolutely free, but as a special offer, we're giving a 50% discount for channels that have less than a thousand subscribers that purchase the Pro Upgrade. All you have to do is enter in the code RISINGSTARBUDDY. So if you're interested in starting a YouTube channel or taking your content to the next level, download the extension now. You can do so by clicking on this link that will be provided in the description of this video. But as I was saying, there's going to be a massive rollout for more news regarding Marvel's Avengers next month. But something seems to have gone under the radar and that's in regards to the game's accessibility and a recent interview given by one of the lead developers. There was a lot of things to take away from this, so I want to go more in depth on what they entail. Firstly, we have to talk about the accessibility, because that's something that a lot of developers strive to master when presenting their games to a broader audience. It's something that games have made some strides over the last few years, especially when it comes to in-game options like difficulty and UI customization. And Crystal Dynamics looks to take it even further by implementing features to ensure players with disabilities never feel left out. The studio worked with consultants and accessibility specialists to get early feedback on the superhero action affair. And while most of the chat focuses on its efforts and not the results, there is mention of a few features that have made their way into the game, including a high contrast UI, remappable controls, subtitles and closed captions, and training rooms. I don't have any details on any of the other features, but from what I understand, the attempt to make it more accessible won't end when the game is out the door. In an interview on Square's site, senior community manager Megan Marie and game designer Maria Robinson talked about all the different ways Crystal Dynamics is making Marvel's Avengers as accessible as possible to everyone. And this design philosophy has influenced several elements in Marvel's Avengers, including an NPC called Cerise who's said to be part of the Inhumans, a group of humans who've been given superpowers after being exposed to Terrigen Mist. This particular character will provide representation for disabled people, but the game's design also helps cater to disabled players, and her idle animations have all been given motion capture by Cherry Thompson, an accessibility specialist who's also been providing feedback on the game. Megan Barree says, and I quote, One of the examples I am most excited about is a high contrast user interface. The high contrast UI feature makes it easier to navigate for low vision users or people who find some interfaces distracting and difficult to use. The UI team really did a great job on that one. Our goal is to normalize representation within our game world by reflecting the diversity of the real world. We have scenes in the game like A-Day which is essentially a comic book convention. Having representation in a crowd of people who are all there sharing a passion for superheroes is important to us. So as you hear, the settings for this game are going to be very flexible. One thing that the community manager alluded to that immediately caught my interest was the fact that this character could have possibly been in attendance during the A-Day tragedy. Which would make a lot of sense because the giant explosion from the helicarrier caused San Francisco to be enshrouded in Terrigen Mist, which most likely resulted in turning this Cerise character into an Inhuman. As we all know, our main protagonist Kamala Khan was one of the ones who was also infected by the Terrigen Mist, so it's safe to assume that her and Cerise will play as these tragic victims who are using their newfound abilities to make a difference in the world. As for what this mystery location she's in could be, I'm gonna go ahead and guess that it's the Resistance headquarters that was briefly shown during the game overview trailer. But anyways, according to Square Enix, Cerise won't be the only disabled character made from Marvel's Avengers. There are also a few existing characters that could be used, and still might be, which would be actual meaningful representation. If you remember back in my last video, we saw a very mysterious person who seems to share a similar look and power to Cerise. At first, I assumed he was part of the Kree since he has their trademark blue skin, but after receiving this information regarding Cerise, I think it's safe to assume that he's also an Inhuman. I'm guessing that he'll play a certain role in the game, or he could be Cerise's male equivalent of some sort, or the two could be related. 
Whatever the case may be, it's going to make the story more interesting seeing how these conflicted individuals deal with their super inhuman powers. But moving on, I wanted to talk about another recent interview we got via a podcast from PlayStation Blog. Yesterday, Crystal Dynamics head of studio Scott Amos was interviewed and he gave more insight on Marvel's Avengers. For those who tuned into last year's E3 conference, you may recognize Scott as one of the panelists alongside Meg Marie. And something that I've noticed right off the bat is that this guy genuinely loves the Avengers. Hearing him explain his passion for these characters reminds me of all the interviews Brian Interhart gave regarding Marvel Spider-Man. He knows what we love about each Avengers member and what they should play like in this game. That's one of the reasons my hype hasn't wavered for this game, even though the marketing has been less than stellar. But anyways, the first question that was asked during the interview was how things have changed since the unveiling of the A-Day mission we got last year. And Scott says that two things have changed. One of the things being the fan feedback being a top priority for the team. Whenever the fans give them feedback, they take it to heart and see how they can correct certain things that not everyone likes, whether it be the character's gameplay or how they look. And they've constantly been testing the game to make sure each character plays distinctly different into the fan's liking. The second thing he mentions is the gear slash upgrade system. It's something that we have yet to see and he's excited to reveal how fans can customize moves for the Avengers. The next question that was asked was what makes Marvel's Avengers story different from the stories we've seen in the MCU or any other Marvel lore. And once again Scott says that they focused on two things picking the villain and what he describes as a point of view character. They ended up selecting Kamala Khan as the point of view character since she's relatively new and is just coming into her own. He goes on to describe her as a center point that'll immediately help Crystal Dynamics stand alone as the first to showcase her origin story and how she needs to find her way into the world they're trying to establish. He then talks about the main villains being AIM aka Advanced Idea Mechanics who isn't really new to Marvel but they haven't necessarily been expressed as the primary antagonist in mainstream media. Having these two not so familiar elements of Kamala Khan and AIM will help set their game apart from other previous Marvel games and I totally agree with Scott's opinion. There's really not a lot of people who are familiar with these characters and considering the fact that this is a AAA game I think it's going to undoubtedly introduce these concepts to a broader audience of people who've never heard of them. But moving on, the next question that was asked was what, what philosophy did Crystal Dynamics approach when creating new movesets for the heroes? And Scott stated that one of the biggest challenges Crystal Dynamics faced was actually taking what they know with previous games they worked on and expanding on it with things they don't know. They have tons of heroes who move differently, fight differently, have different types of projectiles, and have different powers. So they had to reach out to an individual who specializes in those different areas. And that individual is Vincent Napoli, who's a guy who's done combat design for games like God of War 2018. He's the key to making the characters feel great. And you guys have heard me say incessantly how I feel like this game's combat is going to be dope based simply on the fact that Vincent is in charge of it. If you enjoy playing God of War, then I have no doubt that you'll enjoy playing this game with its star-studded roster. And based on the things Vincent Napoli has posted on Reddit, you already know that the skills and upgrade system is going to be very intuitive. If you want to invest in repulsors for Iron Man, you can do that by upgrading his skill tree. Or you can focus on other weapons such as his precision lasers, which is something I'm going to be using a lot. And this is something that's going to make the online co-op so much fun, seeing what others do with their customized Avengers characters. Now something that Scott Amos mentions that I know a lot of you will get a kick out of is how the gear will be made by different manufacturers. Meaning that it won't just be Tony Stark designing all the weapons to make his fellow Avengers members look cool, you'll also have gear made by others such as Hank Pym. For example, you can equip Pym particles to Iron Man's precision lasers and once you do enough damage to an enemy, you can shrink them down to deal even more damage. And that specific gear can also be upgraded to add more potency to the effects. If that doesn't show the level of creativity that's going into this game, then I don't know what does. This most certainly answers a question that's been on everyone's mind, and it's in regards to the mysteriously small figure that was seen in the most recent trailer we got. Many assume that it could have been Hank Pym slash Ant-Man fighting alongside Iron Man, Hulk, and Miss Marvel. But after hearing Scott Amos mention the Pym particle laser, I think it's safe to assume that it was an enemy that was shrunken down after Iron Man hit it with his laser. Something tells me that the Pym particle laser was alluded to when we saw Hank testing out a similar weapon on one of the Dreadbots in the E3 trailer entitled Pym Particles. So I think it's safe to assume that this is a weapon that Hank has been working on for Iron Man and possibly other members of the Avengers. And Scott Amos mentions that this specific gear is one of his favorites. He says that it's one of the most comical yet amazing abilities that allows you to shrink down things like giant robots and smack them around with characters like the Hulk. But moving on, the next question that was asked was in regards to how the loot system will work for players who've spent hundreds of hours playing the game. 
And that's where Scott delves more into the war table concept. He says that it's an interface that'll be located in the middle of the damaged helicarrier base and will serve as a lens to the entire world. And you'll be able to access various hotspots of action. Whenever the player jumps on or offline, the war table will always lead them to the next piece. If it's a story mission, you'll see the Avengers A logo on a specific area of the map. But after the story is done, the world will open up with various types of war zone missions which will have their own unique stories. And there are specific missions called Hero Chains, where if you have a character such as Black Widow on your roster, it will open up an exclusive set of missions for her with her icon. The Hero missions will also tell you more about the members and fill in gaps of things that weren't present in the main campaign. And Scott says that they'll continue adding more Hero missions post launch. And this essentially answers questions we had about the Warzone missions when it was revealed in the game overview trailer. We knew about the hero missions which are basically the single player campaign missions but it didn't really go into details about the hero chain. And as you can see there were two hero chain missions for the Hulk and Black Widow. Considering the fact that these missions will fill in the gaps to certain events for those members I wouldn't be surprised if it also uncovers things going on with some of the villains as well. I mean Scott does mention that these missions will show what AIM is up to after the main story. But anyways, I wanted to talk about the unlockable costumes because Scott mentions how they'll be earned in the game. He says that some can only be unlocked after completing certain hero missions while others can only be obtained after completing hero chains or bosses. This will definitely give us a lot of replayability and make the war table extremely flexible in terms of content. But the next question we get is in regards to the easter eggs and Scott mentions one of the suits I've been wanting from Jump and it's the invincible Iron Man suit. He doesn't flat out say that the Invisible Iron Man suit aka Model Prime armor is in the game, but based on this recent image that was revealed you can tell that one of his more powerful suits, the Bleeding Edge, is in fact in the game. And the Model Prime will most likely be as well. You see the little repulsors going along Iron Man's shoulders, arms, knees, knuckles, chest, back and legs. And we also got a brief look at it during the character spotlight trailer but no description was given on which suit it was. But now we know that it's the bleeding edge armor or based off of it. As to whether the suit will come with all the abilities or not, it most likely won't since the suits will merely serve as cosmetics. And it's a little upsetting since the model prime suit can create damn near anything since it's made of completely nano machines and whatnot. But I'm not going to nitpick the game over that. This is just a reference to the lore and if we're going to get mad at Crystal Dynamics then we have to give that same energy to MCU films like Captain America Civil War that featured an obvious reference to the Bleeding Edge armor but lacked all of its abilities. It took until Infinity War for them to combine the Bleeding Edge and Model Prime armors together to make the Mark 50 suit which features both of their abilities. But besides the Bleeding Edge costume, we also get a look at a new costume for the Hulk and I believe this is based off the costume featured in the Ultimate Wolverine vs Hulk miniseries comics. The costume was also seen in Thor Ragnarok during a comedic bit where Thor is forced to converse with the Hulk while the Hulk is in the nude but eventually the Hulk gets dressed again in that costume. We also get a brief look at Thor in action in his Lord of Asgard outfit which is inspired by the comic of the same name published in 2011. But that's all I have for you guys today. I hope that everything I've uncovered for you guys has made you even more hyped for the game. I know this video was longer than the usual videos I upload but I just had to get as much info as possible. But anyways let me know what you think. Do you like that Crystal Dynamics is going above and beyond to be more accessible? And how do you feel about the cool powers we'll have such as the Pym Particle Laser? Let me know down in the comments below. As always I ask that you like or dislike the video. It doesn't have to be a thumbs up, it can be a thumbs down. Any feedback is good feedback and will only help me improve on future videos. But if you really enjoyed this video, it would help me out tremendously if you shared it with all your friends and followers on social media. Sharing really makes a difference. But once again, this is your boy RBG signing out on another video. I'll catch you guys later. Peace out.